I'm pleased to welcome Nina George to Politics and Prose. George is a journalist, writer, and storytelling teacher who has written 27 books as well as feature articles, short stories, and columns. Her previous book, The Little Paris Bookshop, spent over a year on bestseller lists in Germany and was a bestseller in Italy, Poland, and the Netherlands. Now, in The Little French Bistro, George tells the story of Marianne who, after a dramatic episode on the banks of the Seine, runs off to Brittany to escape her loveless marriage. At a restaurant called Armour, Marianne is able to rediscover her past carefree self amidst good friends and good food. Kirkus Reviews writes, George's engrossing novel is as much about indulging the senses with succulent dishes and dazzling sights as it is about romance and second chances. With a profound sense of place and sensuous prose, the novel functions as a satisfying virtual visit to the French Riviera. Hopefully we'll get to go there tonight. <laughs> now please join me in welcoming Nina George. So, hello everybody. <laughs> hello. My, uh, oh, oui, oui, bien sûr, bonsoir. <laughs> uh, vous parlez uh, du français aussi? Uh, Quelqu'un parlait du français? Ah oui, un petit peu, un petit peu. Und spricht auch irgendjemand Deutsch wohl möglich? Ein ganz kleines bisschen? Nicht. Ich muss, uh, I have to admit you that my body is still thinking it's uh, around midnight. Maybe it's, for me it's, uh, yeah, one o'clock in the evening. So um, I hope you don't mind me if I just um, sip a drink um, while reading and um, talking to you a little bit. I have been arriving to the U.S. on um, Saturday night after a long flight, 10 hours flight from Paris to, to come to New York first. Yesterday was my first show in um, R.J. Julia in Madison, Connecticut. And um, I have to change my dictionary in the hat because I have been living in France now for two months. And while I'm searching all the words in English, sometimes the French is coming up and what coming out of my mouth is German. <laughs> So maybe sometimes it's getting a little bit jolly or I'm um, looking for the words and so on and so on. What can I tell you about uh, me that is not on the homepage? Okay, um, I'm Nina George and I'm a um, journalist since I'm 18. I'm writing under five pen names, also like Anne West or like Jean Bagnol. And um, I was uh, married to a writer named um, Joe Kramer. I was so in love that I took his name. <laughs> Yeah, we, we met uh, and uh, three months later we were married and I was so in love still with my hormones all in the head and I took the name Kramer, so under the name Kramer I was also writing some thrillers and mystery. But under Nina George, um, this, is, this had been the novel before The Little Paris Bookshop. And I want to make a little test with you who have read The Little Paris Bookshop. Okay. Okay, for these ones who uh, have not read The Little Paris Bookshop, it's about um, a man living in Paris. He has a boat, a literary pharmacy, where he's going to sell books like they are medicine for the soul. But this book, The Little French Bistro, I have written before. I have written it uh, about nine years before, but um, I'm really happy that I took a long way to now stand at this desk to introduce you to this um, to this book because this for me it was the most important book I had been in my mid 30s I had been in my mid 30s and had written about five novels but there were kind of novels that I tried to 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 please the market uh, if you if you ever want to write, please, please do yourself a favor. Never follow the rules of the market. Please follow th your inner rules. Because when you are following the market and doing a something accident like um, like this, I don't know what is uh, this called with this um, prince. Uh, he's very rich. Oh, I think yeah, it might be the one with the sadomastic uh, um, techniques. Who read this accident? Uh, Fifty Shades of Grey? <laughs> Jesus, it was a success, yes. But when you're doing it again, well, there is already Fifty Shades of Grey. You don't have to do it again. So do please your own. I was um, 35 when I've written this book, and it took me nearly 
25 years to become famous overnight. <laughs> so I'm a real working writer. I'm also writing um, reports, uh, essays, columns, and I'm also in the board of the German Pen Club, as well as in the board um, of the Writers Association in Germany, as well as some several other boards. And yes, you can call me also a feminist, and you can call me also an activist for authors' rights. But now I put another hat on. Now I'm standing in front of you as a writer. Um, before I start, I, I would love to tell you how, how this book is um, well developed. Um, I want to read a short part. I know that in the US it's totally different than in Germany. In Germany you come in into a wonderful bookshop, but I have to admit this is quite a real fabulous bookshop. And this bookshop is also famous in Germany. <laughs> Pros and politics and the audience and the events and the attitude to speak up, to really speak up, this is even famous in Germany. So I'm so proud to be here and um, later on in Germany I will tell all the people that you have been great, so please be great. <laughs> um, so German. The language German is not very famous for his um, poetic prose. When you look on your own language, English, you have, for example, butterfly. Isn't it soft? Isn't it easy? You can see even the butter flying through the butter. And in French, you have the wonderful word papillon, papillon. But when it comes to German, you have schmetterling. So maybe, um, so maybe this uh, German sounds a little bit well odd to you, but um, if you don't mind, I would uh, read the first sentences in German so you can get a little bit familiar with the sound. So, es war die erste Entscheidung, die sie alleine traf. Das erste Mal eben, dass sie bestimmte, was zu tun war. Marianne beschloss zu sterben. When it comes to English, it sounds a little bit more smooth. It was the first decision she had ever made on her own. The very first time she was able to determine the course of her life, Marianne decided to die. Why did I choose Marianne? Marianne is a 60-year-old German lady. She does not speak any word of French except of bonjour, but when she is saying that, it's more like bonjour. And we say when the French say merci, um, she's saying, mercy. <laughs> and with this um, lack of um, French knowing of, uh, of the language, she goes to, um, to Paris, and yes, she is deciding to die. But if that would really happen, well, let me see. Yes, the novel would end at page six. <laughs> and my German publisher told me, well, darling, I give you 10,000 euros in advance. I want a full book, not a short story. But when it came to my, to my head, I was sitting in, in, in Britannia. Uh, sometimes people call it Brittany, but to be exact, it's Little Brittany. It's Britannia. When you imagine the map of France, you see uh, in the north a kind of lying dragon that is biting in the sea. And there, at really the end of the world, in the most western part of France, there is the Britannia, La Britannia, the Little Brittany. The, um, um, the people normally say it's the end of the world, but when it comes to the Britain inhabitants, they say it's the beginning of the world. And when you um, are reading some geological um, books or something like that, you will find out that this part of Britannia is made of the oldest stones you have ever seen and found in Europe. So this part of Europe is the first part and around that Europe was built. And you can feel it over there. It's um, totally different, I think, to whatever you ha might have been visited yet. It's wild. Um, the sea is hungry. It's a she, for sure, in the French language. La mer, la mer. And she's a she. And she's sometimes hungry. And sometimes she's so jealous. And sometimes she wants to fight. And sometimes she wants to eat all the land up. 
and uh, the nights are so dark and you, do, you can see the Milky Way and it's so soft, but sometimes the wind is also biting you. You will find no skyscrapers anywhere. It's the hardest terrain pour, um, for <laughs> sailing, excuse me. So if there's here any sailor, sailors in here, sailor, you ha oh yes, please, you too. When you come to Brittany, be aware of this wild she sea. But after you managed it, please send me a Facebook note. I'm always online, um, even now. Um, I'm always online. Send me a note. Come to my little white house at the seashore. We will have champagne on the terrace. <laughs> <laughs> you have to, but please, this terrain is very, very dangerous. Um, this landscape of Brittany is a kind of secret third protagonist in my, in my novel. So Marian decided to die, but well, it doesn't work. I have to, uh, okay. It doesn't work. She is uh, saved by a clochard. It's not a kind of beggar you see sometimes in the streets of also Washington. Uh, to be a clochard is also a kind of philosophy. It's meant being free, but for also economic economical reasons, for sure. Paris is not so romantic as you think. Absolutely not. It's well illuminated and you can buy things that you don't need to and you can have a really really bad cafe au lait on the champs elysees for too much money gosh and you have these all these arrogant waiters when you're not talking french they well they prefer not to understand you so but um she decided to 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 um, pass away it didn't work a clochard is saving her she went to the hospital there's a meeting with her husband lota I have to admit, um, my relationships wasn't, well, before I met my husband, all my partners were so jealous about my work. But my work is my first lover. I decided uh, when I was a teenage girl, I want to be a writer. And my first um, uh, love affair told me, why do you want to be a writer? What do you have to say? And I felt so ashamed. But on the other hand, I, I thought there are people that keeps you down in your world. Um, my husband called them um, uh, a swarf maker. So they make you really little. They don't want that you're changing. They don't want that you're moving. They don't want that you, well, develop. Um, and my, um, my partners had s some symptoms of holding me down. And one of them... Well, he is now Lothar. That was my revenge. <laughs> this was my little revenge. Mariana is um, 60 years old, and when it comes to the question, why does a 30-something writer write about a woman in the autumn of her life, taking the risk to end her life, taking the risk to travel through France, right until at the end of the world without speaking a word French, just escaping from everything. Um, I was raised as a child and educated in a family full of cooks. So I'm, I'm, I'm a sort of, um, I'm working since I'm 11 years old in kitchen. Uh, with 18, I switched to journalism and writing. But um, I was living in a small town in Germany that is called Bad Pyrmont. And when you um, read the word Bad, it's, it's written like bad, but it means bath, bath. You know, that is um, a village where people can get healthy again. And normally there are a lot of people that, well, that had been living a little bit more longer than other people. And when I was a young teenager, I serve all the women and I sit down and I like to listen. I like to listen to people. Um, well, in this moment now, I have to talk. Uh, I'm a little bit talkative, I, I know. <laughs> um, but I love to listen to people. And I found it more interesting to tell a story how a woman in her autumn of her life starts to break out. Because the cage she had built around her for years and decades, it's, it's, it's more difficult to, to, to have a break out. And um, as I listened to all these ladies, I found something out. Age is just a number. And we have so much in common. I'm now 44. Um, but there are feelings that are so similar to one who is 14 or 44 or 64. It's like being in love, but the one 
which you love is not loving you. It's the same old wound that is touching. Or um, the question, did I become the person I should have become? Well, you can ask yourself this question at any age, even if you're a man. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, <laughs> I don't know how many husbands here are today because uh, um, your wife um, told you, please, please, we, we hadn't done uh, so many things in the last uh, weeks, please come with me and we can have some dinner afterwards and some champagne. <laughs> Yesterday I was asked if I can tell some French secrets and I was nearly, nearly, nearly I said, well, put some champagne on everything and it works. But then I decided to sell, tell, okay, French secrets, I have a beauty secret, two lipsticks and a lover. <laughs> if you don't uh, have a lover, just take three lipsticks. <laughs> just for the day, for the night, and for the evening. <laughs> um, okay. I wanted to tell a story about um, this wild, old landscape. When you're coming there, it breaks you up. Um, I hope this metaphor I, I try to explain is, um, is, is, is fitting with that. But it feels always when I'm going there after I had been in Berlin doing my advertising and uh, not advertising, ad advisory things for all my associations, working with politicians, being so brave and being so rational and being so cool and being so blah, blah, blah. Um, I go to Brittany and everything is striped down. Everything is peeled down. All the facades, all... Um, of this rational thing and I go back to my own demons. I always hope that I can lock them anywhere, but when I'm in the Bretagne, the landscape, the wind, the wilderness, the, the nature is stripping all down and I'm reaching myself. So, when you want to get rid of yourself, come to Brittany. So you find yourself maybe there again. So this was uh, the landscape I want to put this woman in, this so Oh, in a caged woman, this elder woman, not old woman. I mean, 60 is nothing. My man had just, and please don't tell him that I told you. <laughs> uh, we had a birthday party in Zanary sur Mer. Some of you who have read, uh, who have read the Little Paris Bookshop will, um, will uh, remind uh, yourself of Zanary sur Mer. We had been there for two weeks together with some people out of France, together with some people out of New Jersey. So it was a wonderful birthday party and he wins 60. And when you look at him, 60 is nothing. 60 is in the middle of everything. You're a bright flower with 60. I'm, I'm really happy that, well, I will be 60 one day. Um, but nevertheless, it's hard to break up when you're in that age. And uh, the third thing I wanted to tell is love in trouble. All these novels I also have read and also enjoyed is about love with an happy end. But I think love with an happy end is fictional. Yeah. And so I put around Marianne an uh, ensemble of wonderful, strange, eccentric, direct people who has also some secrets of different sort of troubled love. And if I am um, so, so smart and would find the page again, yesterday I used to search and search the whole evening for the pages. Ah, oh yeah, this is about cooking. We should talk about cooking too. Oh yes, oh yes, 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 yes. So, just imagine the woman who was trying to suicide herself in the sand, who was putting herself on a road movie through France without speaking any word of French, meeting nuns, eating an oyster for the first time, walking through these wild forests, being at the end of the world, and she wants to give herself to the sea? Well, and then she reached this little town, Kedrück. Kedrück is also real. You will find it also in the near of Compère or uh, Lorient. Or and it's, um, it's a village where all the boats are snuggling together and you hear all these little noises, all these metal lines are doing and uh, the sea and the sun 
when the sun uh, goes down, the sea is looking like a silk that is smoothly, very smoothly moving. And she stands there and crying because it is the most wonderful place in the world she had ever been. And she realized, I never had been on any places where I should have been. Why do I waste my life? My life is like a book and the pages are blank. The pages are blank. Why do I have forgotten to be the main figure in my own book? Um, a thunderstorm is coming in that scene and she, she tries to, to find any help, but there's no body at this village except of a cat. <laughs> and this cat is um, trying to, 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 to give her a signal that there's a boat and she's slipping on the boat and the thunderstorm is rushing over this little village and she puts off all her clothes, snuggled into this little cabin and fell asleep. And the next morning, <gasps> the next morning she's wake up and she's in the middle of the sea on a little tiny white boat and there's nothing around her. In the meantime, I just want to introduce you to, um, well, two typical Breton men. Yeah, I think I have the time. Paul drove into Kedrick. It was always best to sober up and let the wind and the sun wring the night from his body. His old friend Simon had left coffee, milk and pancakes on the kitchen table that morning, along with a bottle of Père Magloire Calvados. One of the chickens had jumped up onto the table and was observing his egg. Despite a quick nap on Simon's couch, Paul felt as if he had been dragged through a hedge backwards. Maybe he could convince Simon to let him help out in the farm shop later. After Simon had stopped going out to sea to work, he had converted his fisherman's cottage in Cabouin into a mini market and now lived with his chickens in the kitchen. Simon sold all kinds of stuff to gullible tourists. Ice honey, for example, collected by frost-resistant bees. <laughs> yes, yes, from flowers that grew in glaciated valleys in the Pyrenees. Yes, sure. The tourists didn't need to know that it was just tangy buckwheat honey. Then there was Simon's scam with the menhir seeds. A man here, um, just, uh, just a footnote, uh, when you come to Brittany, you will find all these strange stones. They're everywhere, millions, thousands of them, and nobody knows why are they are there. Uh, has anybody planted them? Is it uh, out from the Neolith times or from the Celtic? Nobody knows where, why they are. So, he had the idea with the man here seeds. A paper sachet, emblazoned with a drawing of the fields of megalith stones in Kanak, containing a few grams of granite that he had trickled from a crack in the outside wall of his house. <laughs> but then you have to throw them into your garden. Yes, like this, like this. Maybe you can do also some avocadabra if you like. Menhirs grow very slowly for the first hundred years, you have to know. Simon would explain to his differential patrons. It would help if they used good old Celtic soil from Little Brittany as fertilizer, which meant he could sell them a handful of dirt from his garden to go with the bit of stones. <laughs> but the best things about Simon's little store was that there were so many women in summer, and they found everything so, oh, this is nice and so sweet. They wore short dresses and dreamed of catching a Breton fisherman and having their very own ladies' chatterly lover moment. Simon didn't really like talking to all these tourists, especially these sophisticated Parisian women. Oh, mon dieu, les parigots, oh, ça m'énerve. And he wasn't keen on pretending to be a rustic hunk. But for Paul, the gathering of so many different women in one place was a delightful occurrence. So he pulled alongside Simon's battered Citroën, whose bonnet was pointing towards Armour Terrace. Bonjour, Monsieur Paul, called Laureen, the very young and very jolie waitress from Armour, as the former legionnaire got out of his car. Paul went over to stand next to her. Oh, bonjour, Laureen. 
He peered at the mouth of the Aven, of the river Aven, but all he could see was the Gwen too making for the quayside. There! cried Lorin. Her overexcitement made Paul feel a little bit slightly dizzy. Simon was standing on the Gwen too, yes, and always on his boat, and next to him. There! repeated Lorin. Yahoo! No. Oh, no! A woman! Paul gasped. How on earth had Simon managed to pick up a woman and take her on a boat trip before lunch? <laughs> the traitor! Hadn't they sworn last night to each other with Calvados Magla that woman were to play no further part in their lives? Well, <laughs> no major part at all. So Simon really picked up Marianne out of the sea. And this is the beginning of, um, well, the real story. Because um, Marianne is mistaken as the new chief, uh, the not the new chief, the new chef cook. And, um, well, yes, she can cook. She can cook because that has, uh, she has done this every year and every second and every day to Lothar. Lothar is, by the way, um, um, a sort of uh, general at the German military. And uh, sometimes <laughs> Marianne is thinking, when I'm leaving him, well, he gets lost in supermarkets between the tampons and the tea. <laughs> but maybe he will manage it. So she started to work in this um, kitchen. She uh, is learning all the Britain way to cook. And um, every day she decides not to suicide. She goes every day to the sea. She learns to play accordion again. And every day is something new that makes her, well, tomorrow. Yeah, if I do, will do it tomorrow. I, uh, tomorrow, I, yes, I will give me to the sea. Yes, tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. But this tomorrow never comes. For sure, you have to read it on your own. Why and uh, because. But you will find out that there's, um, this is a story also about friendship. About friendship that grows. Because friendship, I think, is the most patient form of love. You will see how everybody is struggling with love. You will be filled up, I think, also with... Um, with a sense, the aromas of Breton cooking. You know, I'm, I'm cooking by myself and uh, during the research, for sure, I learn how to cook the Breton way. And uh, maybe I will let you out of this talking. Yes, I'm just 20 second minutes. Maybe I have two more. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I will tell you something about the French, uh, the, no, the Breton way to cook. Meat. Is there anyone who is doing barbecue? Barbecue cookers here? No? How do you do your steak? Ah, uh, we will see how Jean Remy is doing it. Jean Remy is a little chef. Jean Remy was standing at the stove in Amor's kitchen, his injured hand hooked into the waistband of his jeans. Um, he looked at her and he is surprised of this hunger in the eyes of this once lost woman. As the first steak orders began to come in, Jean Remy beckoned Marianne to his side. Okay, no seal marks in my kitchen. That's the kind of torture housewives and barbecuing husbands inflict on steak. It's barbaric. Watch me. You need an oval pan, a little pan, and then you take a little butter. Just medium heat, not too much hotness. That way the batter stays close, very close to the steak, inside of spreading out, messing around with the shallots and getting burnt. Do you understand? Oui. Marianne watched him with fascination. He didn't wear the meat out, he caressed it. Soon he lifted the steak out of the pan onto a hot plate and pushed it under a three-level grill set to 80 degrees. Yes, and the receipt is also in the book. He left it there to cook a little longer and then gave it another minute on a warm plate before arranging the trimmings around it. Voila! Any other way of cooking and the steak curls up and dies. So if all you've ever done until now is toss meat onto the grill, forget it! Try it even once, lady. 
and I kill you. Huh? He drew his hand across his throat like a blade. Marianne blushed. Then jean Remy fetched a chopping board with squid tentacles on it and set it down among the shadows near the doorway. Seconds later, a little orange-white cat emerged from its hiding place near the herbs. It waggled its backside <laughs> in the sun as it gnawed away at this little delicacy. So, am I in time, Kathy? <laughs> so, perfect. I would love to tell you more and more and more in Germany. I do a 90 minutes show just sitting down there with a glass of water, wearing all my black stuff, being very existential and <laughs> nerving you with 90 minutes reading what's meant to be 40 pages. <laughs> so I thank you for your patience. I did a little bit of uh, improvisation and I would love to hear if you want to um, ask me anything so I can train my jolly English a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, there are microphones just, and they are on. Can you hear me? <laughs> can you hear me, Major Tom? Um, so I found um, the couple, Emil and Pascal, Pascal. Yeah, Pascal and Emil. Yeah, mm -hmm. I found them to be absolutely fascinating. Of all the couples in the book, and there are many, many. There we go. There are many interesting characters, um, but I found their relationship and their friendship uh, to be intoxicating. Were they characters that you wove into the story, or did you know you wanted to start with that type of couple? Um, the story came up um, two years before I started to write them. I was in the middle of Little Brittany. I was hanging around at a bar tabac. A bar tabac is a mix of, yeah, where, where can you buy drinks? Where can you buy cigarettes? Where can you bet on horse races and so on? And it was a Monday morning. No, not really morning. It was uh, 12.30, I think. And I watched um, five or six elder people wiggling out of the bar tabac. And they were a little bit tipsy. And they helped each other. Oh, I think we should go back and take the champagne encore. Um, and I thought, wow, this, <laughs> this, this couples, this friendship, there is so, um, so an intimacy in between them. And I wanted to create, half create, and half it comes to me by watching this, this people, how they interact with each other. I wanted to create a couple that have done 40 or 50 years together, betraying each other. Well, it was she, uh, she, she was Theodas, and she was fabulous. Now she is um, ill, she, is, um, she has an Alzheimer's disease. But this love in between them, Pascal is ill, but Emil says to himself, I know this woman, and I know every variation of that woman. I know every face, I know every development, and I'm a lucky man that I had the chance to be with this woman in all her life to see who she had been. She had been great. She had been triste aussi. She had been a wonderful flower. She had been my wife. She had been a lover for other men, but who? Well, these other men, they have just good taste. Who cannot love my woman? <laughs> You have um, you have to know in, in in France it's not usual to have affairs, but it's not s such an affair to have an affair. So um, and this growed love, they let each other the free space. I think, and that is my new novel also about that. Every one of us has a hidden space in us where we well just be ourselves and it depends on how big your space is maybe it's just this this tiny it's all only your thoughts but maybe it was also um, 
the space of um, a hidden room in a hotel where you meet some strangers to make love to them. So, and they, l each other, they let the other have space. And I wanted mm -hmm. to tell that because this is a part of love that is not very often told in novels. Love is sometimes told like an illusion, just you and me forever. <laughs> But life isn't like that. And I wanted to show, yeah, I, I had that in mind. And I needed, and I needed a Briton guy that uh, he was, Emil at the first is very, very angry because Marianne is German. Excuse me, German, French, World War? Ah. Uh. So, yeah. That thank is you. Why? Excuse me, this was a l long answer. <laughs> <But> thank you. <laughs> thank you. I can even um, um, answer more shortly, but beware, I'm not lying. Huh? <laughs> even not on politics or money or um, lipsticks. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, the uh, last uh, 10 years have been a difficult story for European integration. Mm -hmm. You are a, a German woman. You write about the de France and Bretagne. Your books are bestsellers in the Netherlands and Poland and Italy. And uh, even in China, since I know since uh, well, that's uh, an not, hour. That's not European. Uh, <laughs> uh, <coughs> what, uh, are you cognizant of your contribution in Europeanization? Are you interested in it? Uh, how, do you, how do you think about that? Um, now I put my other hat on. And I take water for this. As I told you, I'm also on the board of the Pan Club Germany and as well as the Writers Association in Germany. So everything when what comes up with the refugee crisis, with all the um, um, with all the things that are happening in front of our door, the right wing parties that are in every country are growing. Um, I'm for sure interested in that, and I'm a political activist working on that, uh, doing resolutions, manifestos, going on demonstration, uh, speaking out loud in the newspapers and so on. But there's a but. But there's a but. I like to write these novels because this helps me to flew and to escape from this world. And I think everybody needs sometimes the time to escape into another world. But um, in my crime novels, uh, I, I'm also writing short stories, um, crime novels, and so on. They are always uh, contemporary, and they are always dealing with the situation we have. But they are only uh, small stories. But for me and for my readers, I think sometimes there's a need to escape. And you can escape in my book. <laughs> I'm drinking wine now, so I put my writer hat now. <laughs> okay, well, uh, you can get creative then. Um, I, I love your writing style. It's wonderful. I just finished my first book of yours, and I'm sorry I hadn't found you earlier. What do you read? Oh, mm. oh I prepared it. <laughs> <laughs> I prepared it, and I um, had, a, had a short walk um, uh, in this wonderful bookstore. I, w I, I would love to be, to be locked in this night. Could, 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 could we manage it? Um, well, I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, when I'm on tour, I'm always reading um, um, e-books. So, uh, e-books are also stories. Don't look on the medium, just look at the content. So, I was re-reading re François Sagan, Bonjour Tristesse. I was young when I read it uh, before, and now I'm 44, and I'm a professional writer. And now I can see, my goodness, she was great. Um, I started to read again uh, Anna Segas with Transit because Transit was um, uh, written during uh, the World War II and all the refugee crisis when all the exile writers came from Germany and tried to escape into the world. Um, I'm reading Veronique Olmi, A Man, A Woman, Kenneth Haruf, Our Souls by Night. Uh, I was reading Sweet Bitter. I think you have it um, over there on the first um, on the first uh, table, and I start to read more and more women. Because, as you know, I'm also a feminist and I'm an um, activist for women's rights, but that also means the rights of women's writers. And in Germany, I don't know, maybe in um, America, it's the same. Women writers um, earn less money; they are not getting 
the same prices. I think men won five and a half times more often high, well, price prices than women. And I start to read more women to talk about what are women writing um, to spread the word of women. So I'm now in these months, I'm really concentrated on reading women again. And if you want to read uh, Veronique Olmi, it's not easy. It's a kind of literature that is breathless on the one hand, but she goes into the details and she just is telling a, a whole novel about an afternoon between a woman and a man in a hotel room. And she gets in more intimate and more intimate and more details and it's breathless also. So if you want to discover something um, different, please try to read Veronique or me. That's my recommendment for this evening. <laughs> I, I don't know if, yeah, this Hi. is on. Hi. Hi. Uh, um, thanks for a wonderful presentation and performance. Um, this is a sort of a facile question, but mm. ah. are there any French or Mediterranean writers who've written anything in Germany? Um, that is based in Germany, like I... Yeah, uh, their escape. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let me think about it. Even children's books or <laughs> any... <laughs> I guess there must be some. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe two. <laughs> <laughs> or even three. <laughs> but they don't come in my mind. Yeah. But uh, uh, you pointed it really out because I have some colleagues who are writing under pen names, nom de plume, like Jean Bagnol, um, Sophie Bonnet, Jean-Luc Balanec, uh, Nicolas Barrault, that sounds very French, but they're all German people. And I, I don't know if you mentioned they're all starting with a B. <laughs> I don't know why. But um, that a French, is, uh, a French writer writes something that is based in Germany, that is not very often, no? Mm. Huh. Just Maybe just it's just a niche in the market. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should put myself, well, I could choose a, a French pen name and then... No, that's complicated. <laughs> it's not going to happen. <laughs> and then everybody is asking, wow, this French lady, how could she know this so well? <laughs> yeah, I should try that. Okay. Uh, has anybody any recommendation from, from a French writer for stories that are based in Germany? Uh, okay, we, we have to do the research. And maybe a little section. So <laughs> Very little section. <laughs> so, religion, money, sex lipsticks. We can talk um, about everything. Maybe you need alcohol for that. <laughs> you mentioned that you write crime novels, mm -hmm. contemporary ones, and I'm wondering why you th why do you think they are so popular, crime novels, as opposed to other kinds of novels? I know my my colleagues, which are writers, we have also an association of crime writers in Germany with 800 members or so. Um, they write because uh, they can control the death. And maybe for the reader it's similar. Another one is dying, not me. Hooray. <laughs> maybe it's that. Or maybe it's the old battle in between black and white and good and bad. I don't know. I don't know. Because sometimes when you're reading contemporary novels, uh, contemporary crime novels, uh, the bad is sometimes also winning. It has mm -hmm. to be like that. So every other thing is an illusion. But when it comes to thrillers, I think uh, most of the people love to um, read thrillers because they're, um, well, they have a heartache. Is heartache the right word for mm -hmm. Liebeskummer? Mm -hmm. Okay, so... Mm -hmm. When I am um, a literary pharmacist and somebody comes to me and says, ah, I'm so sad because he doesn't love me, what should I read, some romance? And I said, no, <laughs> don't romance, you need something where the blood is spreading out <laughs> and all the bones are breaking, so here's a thriller with a lot of blood and walking dead, and yes, yes, this is good for you. And yeah, and maybe this is a kind of uh, escape too. We are all packed in our daily routine with the work and the children and have you been shopping and what do we do with our parents and where do we go in our holidays? Oh, Jesus. And you can escape in a, in a crime novel, in a thriller novel. Yeah, you, it's an escape too. Maybe it's for, I don't know if it's for men more interesting. 
Um, today in the morning, I just read in a report that um, woman, mm, woman would prefer cozy crime. I don't know. And the man thriller crime. I mm. don't know if this is real. Is anybody? Is any woman here that prefers thriller and hard boiled crime than cozy crime? Hands up. Yeah. <laughs> so, huh? <laughs> okay. Where, where's the thriller section? So these ladies might be. <laughs> You're welcome. Hi. And Hi. Thank you so much for your books because now I have more books to give to people as medicine. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And uh, Champagne? Do we have champagne? <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of good medicine and good and bad. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so impressed with the way that France feeds their school children. Oh, and compared yeah. Compared to what we do here, it's oh. the difference between love and kind of poisoning i'm a pediatrician oh. it's a yep. huge problem what did they do in germany um i'm living half part in berlin and half part in Brittany, in little Brittany. and when i'm coming back to france for me it's a relief because the children are so well educated so well educated but also so so loved mm, for example when a German couple with his children um, comes up to the beach, they always say to the children, don't do that, don't climb on that, be careful. And the children is totally stressed. <laughs> In France, um, when a French family is uh, coming to a beach, um, the, the little one will, uh, will have, well, they are just free. Yeah, climb on that. Yeah, just go swimming. But when they are not holidays, not vacances, the children are so well educated because um, I ask my French teacher, I have a French teacher for sure, uh, why? And he said to me, well, people felt ashamed if they are going on the nerves on others. They really feel ashamed. That's an, uh, most of the French people and even the Britain people are very polite and they hate to go on the nerves <laughs> on, one, on, on others. So they try to educate their children so, so well. Um, I found it very practically that um, if you raise a child as a French woman, you can give it to the maternal school very, very early to, um, to go back to the job. So you will find very emancipated um, women in France. There's no, uh, you find them in every métier, in every job. So, um, but there's also a but. <laughs> Sometimes when, um, when I'm with French families, the children are so well educated that I sometimes want to, to grab them and say, just be wild, do something that's going on my nerves. <laughs> 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 do something. But they're, um, well, really well educated. In Germany, we have a lot of helicopter parents. <laughs> they, they have a kind of radar that goes like, where's the kid? Here's the kid. Where's the kid? Here's the kid. <laughs> oh. And they want to, 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 yeah, talk Chinese before you're four years old. And you, you have to do also Tai Chi and Qigong. And um, you have to do this and this and that. And they don't can say no to them. They ask, I often hear on the streets, mothers asking their child, so my darling, what do you want to do now? And I think, don't ask them. They couldn't know in this age, what do you want to do? Uh, so, darling, now, should we have now lunch or should we just play? You can't do that to a child. You can't. So, now I have to admit I have no children. <laughs> 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 so, maybe I'm not the best advisor for this. <laughs> but this is one of the most difference between um, German and, and, and France, yes. In France, the uh, children are well educated and in Germany, they're um, stressed. In German, the word is überfordert. I, I should uh, use my dictionary to, 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 to look it up, what überfordert means. Ms. George, do you mean well-educated or well-behaved? Um, help me with the difference. Um, educated means books, learning, ah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. Ah, good. Th thank you, thank you, thank you th uh, for this because you pointed it out as well behavior but education too because when I come to France and I say oh, I'm a writer they say oh 
just sit down, tell me everything. Because art and culture is so elementary for the for the French people. When I'm saying in Germany at a cocktail party or something like that, so Nina, uh huh, what are you doing? Yeah, I'm a writer. <laughs> yeah, a writer. And do you publish uh, now? Yeah. Yeah, I, I did. Uh huh. And um, should I know you? <laughs> no, not you. <laughs> So um, there's really well behavior as well as later on when they go to school, well educated. They are raised with culture. Culture means painting, eating, reading, music. There's no bourgeois uh, in, in, in art. Uh, in Germany we have um, this um, uh, bürgerliche Mitte, this um, bourgeois establishment that goes to the opera and everybody thinks, oh yeah, they're a little bit snobby. In France you will never find that because everyone is going to the opera in the t-shirt and, and in jeans because it's wonderful music. So, yeah... The French people also have some failures. Don't think that I'm so in love with them. Bien sûr, mais non. Ah, non. Hi. Yeah. I wanted to say thank you. I oh. found the Little Paris Bookshop actually in a store in Dublin recently. And so it was wow. thrilled to see that you would be here today. Um, I loved the scene where Jean Perdu finds healing in the sea. Mm. And when you spoke about Brittany being a character in this book, I think... A lot of France is such a character in that book. Do you have travel writers that you recommend? Or is it mostly just drawn on your own experience? I think uh, everything, or nothing is biographic, but everything is me. Every writer has his own, mm, in German it's a kind of word, a, a filter, filter. So everything what, is, what I'm... Um, Everything is filtered through myself, through my souls, through my principles. And the way I am telling stories is just, well, it's me. And I have to admit, I'm uh, in the Chinese um, horoscope, I'm the element water. So I, uh, I'm home in water. I had been spending now the last two weeks in Sanary sur mer and every day swimming in the sea. And the Mediterranean Sea is a little bit different from the Atlantic. The Atlantic has more tensity. It, it really carries me and is wild uh, too. And the Mediterranean Sea is a little bit more light when you grab into it. It's, it seems like it's, it's lighter. But I'm always doing this, that I'm closing my eyes, spreading out, and let me carry. Let's myself be carried and get to back to this to this faith into the sea into the nature into me um, the little Paris bookshop I had written after my dad had died and my dad was my best friend he was my mirror and my home so I went to the south of France to to find love and life again. And this was most important part of the story because the weeks I spent it there to come to life again, this is exactly what um, that Jean Perdu is um, doing. So yes, this part is maybe biographic. <laughs> Yes. Um, could you please spell, it, ma make sure that we can find that yeah. Veronique Woman book. I, the last name of the author is Veronique, and the name of the book is Woman. All Me. All Me, uh, Veronique is uh, the pre-name, and All Me, O-L-M-E, is uh, the last name. Veronique All Me. Oh. And the, and, and the book is called Woman? Uh, a man, a woman. A man, a woman. Um, ein Mann, eine Frau. I can look it up uh, if the title first <laughs> is translated. And second, if it's the title is uh, also the same, Veronique Olmi. She also had written in, in Germany the title uh, boop, 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 In That Summer. It's a story that is based in the Normandy. Uh, three couples are spending together a weekend on the 14th of July, the big f uh, fete uh, de la France. Um, you have to read that too. It's a little bit more light, but you can, well, it's a story about couples, relationship, friendship, it's very intense, very 
it's, it's what a wow! I, I love this fine finesse, the details, the nuances. She's great. Thank please, you. please Thank read her. Thank you. Thank you. I I have to I have to look it up where um, the titles in in in, uh, in the U.S. We. Oui. Oui, madame. Oui, madame. Oui, madame. I have a French teacher. He is um, um, at this time now. He is sleeping, but he was very brave. He was always typing to me and WhatsApps. Where are you now? What are you doing? Do they um, do they learn some French words from you? And uh, okay, I will. I would love to teach you two Breton words, so I can tell him tomorrow. Yes, <laughs> in Washington now they know two Breton words. <laughs> So the first one is very, very important. It's very important. Um, it's the word yamat. So please repeat. Yamat. It means cheers. <laughs> <laughs> and the second one is when you're, when you're, when you're leaving a boulangerie, a café, restaurant, uh, quelque chose comme ça. Uh, en français, uh, no. um, <laughs> you have to... Um, um, Tell the Britain people, Kenavo, Kenavo, it's bye bye, Kenavo, Kenavo, perfect. <laughs> so uh, it's bye bye, it's bye bye. <laughs> but it's uh, in Britain, and Britain uh, the language is quite similar to Gaelic or to um, uh, uh, Celtic languages, not to French language. It was uh, forbidden for decades in, in the Britannia to speak any Britain, but now there are schools and uh, they try to, uh, to um, yeah, re, re, re something, <laughs> <laughs> reintroduce the Britain language. And sometimes it's, it's sounding like, like a bun is thrown down. Um, uh, an escalier, a treppenhaus, um, 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 some steps. Uh, it, it, it sounds really, it sounds really mad. It's like Pizpihan, Konikel, Marikel, Bretzel, Tomtom, Trinchin, Trinchin, Trinchin. So, yeah. What do you think? Is there any question? Do you want to know another French word? Pronunciation, réfrigérateur, réfrigérateur. That was one of the hardest words for me. Refrigerateur. My tongue is doing something interesting. And I oh, I have to ask you a question. Oh, that is very important. <gasps> is any one of you dancing tango argentino? Tango argentino? Tango argentine? Tango argentino? Tango Argentinian style? Yes? Is it I heard a yes? So let's go to a milonga. I have my tango shoes and the Jefferson. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. I thought I can bring the milonga to Washington. Oh. Oh yes, outside. Oh Sunday. Today is Monday. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, here we have a question. You will dance tango with me now. Okay. <laughs> I don't know how to tango, but let's go. <laughs> 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 <Woo -hoo. laughs> Music. Y your, your talk has carried us all along, and I just loved uh, your previous book that I read. I thought it was wonderful about the idea of healing through books. Maybe that's because I'm a librarian. Huh. Regardless, huh. Uh, I would like to know what you'd like to write next, or what are you working on? Mm. Okay. Um, in Germany, there had been the next novel just coming out. In Germany, it's called Das Traumbuch, what means um, Book of Dreams. And I think I'm allowed to say that Crown has already bought the license and it will come out in 2019. It's absolutely different to the little books, the little French Bistro and the little Paris bookshop. It's different, but I think it's my best and now I'm working on a novel. We found just the title in Germany. It is called um, Die Schönheit der Nacht, what means beauty of night. Uh, it will be based in Brittany, in Little Brittany again, start in Paris, then again in, um, in Brittany. It's about two women, two men. It's about the question, did I become the woman that I should become? Uh, there's a woman in my age, 44. There's a younger woman, um, 20. She's named Julie. The woman my age is named Claire. She's a, 
a scientist of um, behavior and uh, biological um, reasons for our behavior, so very rationalist. There's a husband, there's a younger man, and there are a lot of secrets and lies and passion and very female moments. And I'm just in, um, in the third uh, chapter now. I've written it since, since February, and I did drafts, and um, I'm not numerating the drafts, but I give them alphabetical um, codes, A, B, C, D, E, uh -huh. and after the draft number, H, I, J, J, <laughs> oh! I now got it in, in San Arise Mer. I was um, writing the first three chapters in just three days, and now I got it, and I want to go back and um, write it until the end of August, then is deadline. <laughs> yes, okay. And I hope that Crown will love um, the beauty of night too, because wow, it's so sizzling, it's drizzling, it's bristling, it's a lot of sizzling. Um, yeah. But first of all, the dream, uh, the book of dreams, I don't know what will be the title in the US. It's a very strange, this is a very strange book. I don't know if, it, if I can pitch it, even in German, I can pitch it in just eight seconds. Um, imagine you can live your life again. To which moments would you go to change something? And would you really change it? Because is there any chance to have a perfect life? Yeah, and put some love on it, and put a um, a thirteen-year-old boy in it, and uh, put a publisher in it, and put a reporter in it, and just mix it together, and then there is the book of dreams. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> tango. Thank you. <laughs>